What's up guys? Today we're going to be doing a video on GMAW, a lecture video. Basically everything that you need to know about the theory behind uh, gas metal arc welding. So that's where we're going to start. Gas metal arc welding. This is a um, gas shielded process, which means that there's an externally supplied gas that, um, that protects the weld pool from the atmosphere. And uh, so we talked about this in the last video, you know, the weld pool needs to be protected from the atmosphere so it doesn't bring in contaminants uh, by something. And, and with, in the case of SMAW or stick welding, the flux covered electro, electrode provides that. In this case, it's an externally supplied gas, which is uh, supplied through the power source typically to the, uh, the MIG gun, which will uh, protect the weld pool from the atmosphere. It uses a uh, continuously fed uh, solid uh, wire electrode, uh, which means it, it which makes it a very productive uh, process. Meaning that um, you know you pull that trigger and it's going to keep um, feeding wire until you release the trigger. So it makes for um, extremely long runs. Um, you know if you're skilled enough to to keep on going, um, you can put down uh, you know long lengths of weld and uh, it increases the deposition quite a bit. And uh, so this has become the, the staple for production welding and for manufacturing because uh, it's uh, fairly easy to use. It can be learned uh, fairly quickly, has high deposition rates, um, and puts down uh, pretty good quality welds. Uh, so it's become uh, pretty much the industry staple uh, we're going to try to do wire feed, wire feed type, um, you know, processes when we can to increase production and to get jobs done sooner. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about is is kind of our general setup with uh, with our machine setup, and then we'll get into uh, types of gases, uh, what the different types of gases are, what the different modes of transfer are, meaning how the actual weld metal is uh, transferred to the base material which is, uh, gets a little bit more complicated with GMAW because we have different types of gases affect that differently. And, uh, you know, depending on what type of, of welding we're doing, we make different choices there. Um, and then we'll also get into, of course, technique. I'm going to show you all the different variables in terms of what you're doing that will affect the, uh, the quality of your weld. And then we'll also talk about electrode classification and what to look for there. But the first thing that we'll talk about is just, um, in general, um, what the, the setup is. So um, there's a couple of different things that we can have in terms of a power source. Uh, the one thing that will always be uh, the same is, is that we need to have what's called a constant voltage power source in order to do GMAW effectively. So we're, with SMAW, we were using a constant current type power source which has a little bit different volt and amp curve. Um, you know, it will have a very high open circuit voltage to begin with. And then once the, the arc gets started, um, then that will drop off and uh, it will just uh, try to keep the, the amperage consistent. This is a little bit different, not as high open circuit voltage, but um, it will try to keep the voltage consistent throughout the weld because that really has an effect on um, the quality of the weld that we're getting and how the, the um, actual arc will behave itself. So because um, a parameter that we adjust for GMAW is voltage, um, that is very, very important to um, the way that the wire melts and stuff like that. So uh, the machine, the power source is going to try to keep that voltage consistent no matter what we're doing with the distance that we're coming away from the, the um, weld pool and that sort of thing, the, the power source is going to try to regulate that and keep that consistent throughout the weld. So we're gonna need a constant voltage power source, also known as CV. Now, one thing I wanted to, to mention um, is that there's a lot of multi-process machines out there now um, that will be a CC slash CV, they do both. Um, one thing that they haven't been able to do very consistently, which is starting to change with the better technology, is uh, being able to do both of those things and have alternating current for like aluminum TIG welding. Um, some of the machines that are coming out now are doing a lot better of being able to do just about everything pretty well. 
But up until this point, we kind of had to, you, you had to decide between, you know, am I going to be doing stick welding and TIG welding more, or am I going to be doing MIG and flux core more? And you kind of have to choose between those two things. Um, so they are available uh, multi-process or one or the other, and it just really depends on how much you want to spend and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but enough about that. So in my diagram here, I have my power source, which you'll notice that the parameters that um, we're going to be adjusting on a MIG capable power source is voltage and wire feed speed. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, whereas it was stick welding, we just had basically amperage to control up or down that affects the heat of the weld. Now we have two different parameters that, that kind of do different things. They, they coincide, they work together, but they also do two very different things. So we need to get real comfortable with those and be able to play with our, um, our parameters and our adjustments on the machine to really get what we want to see in terms of weld quality and the profile of our bead. So I'll just give you kind of the, the short version of the explanation of the difference between these two. Uh, voltage would be um, what we could consider like an electrical pressure. Okay, it's the, the amount of uh, power, basically, of voltage that it will take um, for the arc to actually jump across two points in a circuit. So if you have those two points close together and you start to turn up voltage, at some point when you get high enough voltage for the distance that's between them, that arc will actually um, jump across those two points. So that's what voltage is. It's that, that amount of electrical pressure. And hopefully I'm explaining that well enough for you. So that has an effect on the profile of your bead. It has an effect on, you know, um, just overall the, the ability for um, the power source to, uh, to establish an arc and to, to melt that um, welding wire. So typically, as you know, if you're using an 035 welding wire, and then you go up to an 045 or a 0.062, a larger diameter welding wire that's a solid wire, you're gonna need more voltage to, to um, weld with those. So always remember that you're gonna go up in voltage with a higher diameter wire. Now the other parameter that we have is wire feed speed. So that's actually measured in inches per minute here in the United States, um, we're, we're using inches. Um, you may work for a company that uses metric um, then you know that would be different, but we're using inches per minute. So that's actually the amount of inches per minute that are feeding through your wire feeder. Okay, so um, what that does is that that controls two different things. Your wire feed speed is your amperage control. So the higher your wire feed speed is, the more amperage that you're going to have, the more heat you're going to have in your weld pool. Now, that also increases the amount of deposition that you're getting, the amount of filler metal that's going into your weld pool as well. So it will, it, you know, you need to keep that in mind. Sometimes, um, you know, we think, okay, well, I have kind of a high bead, um, a high look to my bead, you know, I need more heat to flatten that out. Well, it could be that you're adding too much filler metal to that bead and that's why it's high. So that might not necessarily be the case. You might want to increase your voltage, which will make your bead a little bit wider and might flatten that out. I'm not saying that's always going to be the case, but sometimes it can be. So uh, just keep those in mind. They, two, they do two different things, but at some point you're going to have to either raise both of those together or lower both of those together because you're going to need a certain amount of voltage to be able to run whatever wire feed you're at. So if those are way off from each other, you know, um, you do need to kind of get them in sync to where they're, they're um, running properly. Okay, and you'll get a feel for that as you uh, get more savvy and get more experience under your belt. Um, so again, we have voltage and we have wire feed speed and wire feed speed would be our amperage control. Okay, um, <clears throat> there is a couple different configurations how we can, uh, that we have with uh, GMAW capable machines. So we have some that are kind of an all-in-one. Uh, meaning that they have a power source and our, um, our filler metal uh, um, spool all in one machine, like a roll-around type cart. Uh, those are very, very common. And then we also have some that have just a power source that's separate and has an external um, wire feeder as well. So you can do uh, either way. Um, a lot of these machines will be like a multi-process machine, like... Uh, you know, an XMT type machine um, from Miller. 
uh, does CC and CV. So that way you can do stick welding, you can do DC TIG, and then you could also add a wire feeder to it and be able to do MIG and uh, flex core, okay? So those are becoming very, very popular too. Uh, so it's just a matter of, of what you have. But in this case, I've drawn them separately just so that I can kind of uh, talk a little bit more about um, you know, the components of the wire feeder here and, um, and uh, you know, illustrate that a little bit better. So in this case, we have um, what, what would be um, a DCEP, a direct current electrode um, positive type polarity. So we're using direct current and the electrode is connected to the positive terminal. So in this case, our positive terminal is connected to our wire feeder, which in turn is connected to our MIG gun, which the wire comes out of and makes contact with our base material. So direct current electrode positive, our electrode's running through here and is running through the MIG gun. So that's connected to the positive terminal and our uh, negative terminal uh, is connected to the ground clamp, which is either connected to the table or our workpiece. Um, so that's, uh, that's the polarity. Again, like I mentioned in the previous video, our uh, electrons always move from negative to positive, just like our attitude, right? Um, so our uh, electrons will move from negative to positive. When they make a, the jump across, that's where our heat is focused. And then I'll make itself make its way all the way back and keep on going. So the reason why I'm showing you this is like, why do I care which way the electrons are moving, right? This can help us to remember where the heat will be focused on the base material or the electrode itself. So in this case, our electrons are jumping front through the base material to the electrode, the tip of the electrode there. And where they make the jump across and encounter the other side is where the heat will be focused. So that means that about 70% of our heat is going to be focused on the electrode. This particular process um, works very well this way. You'll know right away if you ever have your, uh, you, you know, your leads hooked up wrong on this process. You'll be using those same nice, you know, uh, beautiful settings that you're using the day before. And you go to pull the trigger and it's like something is wrong, right? The, the wire's just kind of melting on top of the plate. It's not welding. It's just kind of... Bleh on top, right? Um, you're gonna say, something's wrong. My machine's broken, right? Your machine's not broken. You know if your machine was broken, there'd be a lot of uh, sparks and, you know, there'd be a big puff of smoke and a big pop, you'd know, right? Your machine's not broken, your polarity's wrong, right? So now your heat's focused in that base material and that solid wire can't really, um, is not going to melt properly. So it's just gonna kind of lay on top. So if you ever see that, you know, take a look at your polarity, make sure that your leads are connected the right way, because there are um, other processes that we use the same type of power source for, like flux core, which might be the opposite, direct current electrode negative, which we'll get into um, a little bit later when we get into flux core. But for now, um, uh, just about every type of MIG welding, um, all MIG welding is direct current electrode positive. Okay, so always have the wire connected to the, uh, the positive terminal. Okay, so that's about it for our setup. Um, we do have our gas setup, of course, which is an externally supplied gas. So we'd have a gas bottle and a regulator, which would also be connected to here. And we'll get into the types of gases and how that will affect um, your weld pool in a little bit. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about the things that you're in control of while you're welding that will affect the, the look of your weld, the appearance of your weld, and the quality. Okay, so again, just like, uh, just like any other process, there's basically only uh, about five things that will affect this. Um, your, your two different types of angles, your travel angle, your work angle, your arc gap, or in this case, we call that stick out a lot for MIG welding, the amount of the, the distance between the end of your contact tip and the weld pool. Um, your travel speed, and then any type of manipulation or oscillation that you're doing um, or will all have an effect. So we're going to go through these one by one and kind of explain them a little bit more in depth.
So the first thing that we're going to talk about is our travel angle. And this has a big, uh, this has a, a very, uh, um, this, <laughs> this affects your weld a lot, okay? And also affects the type of bead that you're going to get. So there's two ways that we can do this. We can use what's called a drag angle. So that's if we're kind of dragging the weld pool behind our wire or a push angle. So our, our angle is forward as we're, we're pushing along. And you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, I only push. You know, I don't, I don't do any dragging, I only push because that's the best way that to, to do make welding. And that, th this is a little bit of an argument um, in terms of, you know, you'll have people argue both ways. I've even seen like a lot of different like testing type um, challenges where they will um, do mechanical testing on both. And I really, I haven't seen anything that's very, very concrete um, that will prove uh, it either way. But I'll tell you what I do know in terms of uh, the actual profile of our weld, okay? So um, typically, if we were doing a, a, a drag angle, um, the profile of our bead is going to be a little bit more narrow and higher. If we're doing a push angle, typically our profile will be a little bit wider and flatter. And that's why you have a lot of people say that um, they'll only do push uh, type welding because they want that nice flat bead, which is fine. But I have a lot of people, I know a lot of people, and I kind of tend to believe this myself, that um, more heat is focused into the weld pool and therefore you get more penetration with the drag angle. And it only makes sense because if your drag angle is off a little bit like this, about 20 degrees where it should be, you're focusing the heat of that wire going into the, the weld pool and the arc into that molten, um, that molten uh, wire and, and metal that you just put down. So it's focusing more heat. If you're using a push angle, that same uh, 20 degree push angle, but you're going this way, then a lot of that heat is focused out of the front and you aren't getting as much penetration. Now, depending on what kind of thickness material that you're welding on, uh, whether the work is structural or not, uh, then you, you might want to take that in consideration. If you're welding on really thin sheet metal and you're having problems with burn through and, you know, it, the weld is basically just, uh, you know, functions as a seal or, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not real critical weld, then, you know, you might be able to go to a push. But if I'm doing something that has, um, you know, it needs to be really strong or has any type of like cyclical type of stress on it, or, you know, I just really want to make sure those welds are strong, I'm probably going to do a drag angle, um, you know, in, in, um, in horizontal or flat to uh, make sure that I'm directing as much heat into that weld pool as possible. So it does affect the profile and it can, it, and it can affect the, the strength of your weld as well. Now, like I was saying about a 20 degree drag angle, just like uh, with SMAW, you know, we don't want to get too extreme. If we come too far over, then we're really going to start piling up that weld metal on top of what we just welded. And we're not really focusing the heat into the base material. So we're just putting a weld down, but it's not really, you know, fusing all that base material and the filler metal together. Um, so we want to be careful of that, not too extreme this way and not too straight up and down. Um, get a little bit of a drag angle or a little bit of a push angle to get um, the best possible profile of your bead and the best quality. Now, as far as a work angle goes, that's in relation to the work itself. And again, we want about a 45 degree angle, maybe a little bit lower just to compensate for gravity on a fillet weld like this so that we end up with that nice profile. So that nice, you know, equal size leg lengths profile is what we're looking for just like any other weld. We want these legs lengths to be just about the same and we don't want any excess convexity or excess concavity. Okay just a little slight bit of, of concavity is okay, a little slight bit of uh, convexity is okay but never an extreme. We always want smooth transition in the toes to the base material so we never want to see like a very abrupt angle going into the edges here. And uh, we don't want to see, you know, something that's very, very concave to where there's hardly any weld metal there for reinforcement. So that's a good um, rule of thumb just overall inspecting your own welds. Okay. 
So that would be a uh, work angle, okay? Now, obviously, if we go to the extreme, if we are way too far down, then we're gonna be directing most of our weld metal to that top piece. If we're more straight up and down, then more to that bottom piece, and then we won't have equal leg, leg, leg lengths, and then we should know, oh, maybe my angles are off. You know, Maybe I, I'm directing too much towards that bottom toe because most of my weld is always on that bottom piece. So that's how you can kind of start to look at your welds and see what you think in terms of your angles. Same thing with this weld. If it's really, really high and just balled up, you know, and you see like there's a lot of weld metal just piling up on top. Maybe my angle's way too far, you know, way too far over and I'm using a drag. So that sort of thing, okay? Next thing would be our arc gap or our stick out. So again, that's the distance between the end of this contact tip and the uh, base material or the weld pool. And this has a huge effect on the quality of our welds and just in general what we're gonna see. Um, because of that, as we, it, as we increase the stick out, as we go further and further away, that drops our amperage, okay? That, that will give us a current drop. Uh, meaning that, you know, if we start to move further away, then our, our weld pool is going to get cooler. Um, if you're using a short circuit, meaning that, that sort of uh, sizzling bacon sound at lower voltages and amperages, that's typically um, how we start off with MIG welding is in the short circuit mode of transfer. You're going to start to hear that uh, short circuit slow down. The amount of, of popping per second, you know, is going to slow down and you'll kind of start to see how that will cool down your weld pool and everything will kind of slow down. So a lot of times as we're welding, uh, depending on what we're seeing, you know, if we're on thin material and it starts to, to burn through, I'll kind of move a little bit further out to kind of try to, um, you know, lower that heat down. Or if we get to a spot where we really, really want to make sure that it's melting in and that we're getting good penetration, I'll get in a little bit closer and really try to burn into that area. So you can use that to very um, you know, what you're seeing in the weld pool as you're welding, okay? Typically, we want to try to keep a very short uh, stick out, um, you know, not too close to where we're making contact with the, with the gas nozzle or the um, contact tip to the weld pool, but um, we want to try to keep it as, as short as possible to maintain, maintain control, get good gas coverage, and have a nice, um, you know, hot weld pool as we go, okay? The next thing is travel speed. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. As, uh, as we're moving along here, we want to uh, keep a slow enough travel speed to where the weld pool is filling up with weld metal and we're getting the, the size speed that we would like. Um, and then just try to maintain that travel speed and watch that weld pool and just try to, to vary the travel speed to keep the size of that weld pool consistent throughout your bead. Um, if we're seeing a very, very stringy, sort of thin weld, um, you know, that's just kind of on top, can't really call it a weld, it's just weld metal there, then we know, okay, I'm probably going too fast, you know. If it's really, really large and, you know, irregular shaped, uh, then we know, okay, maybe, uh, maybe I'm going too slow. Could be that and a combination of some other things, like your travel angle or something like that, but it's, it's definitely somewhere to start, try to, you know, um, go a little bit faster and see if that, if that helps the profile of your bead. And then we have uh, manipulation. So with manipulation, I, again, I try, to, uh, I try to encourage people just to get a hang of um, making consistent beads with no type of oscillation or manipulation to begin with. And then from there, you can try some other things. I, for instance, um, do sort of a, uh, just a very, very small whip pattern. It's not very pronounced. I'm not coming out of the weld pool with my whip. We don't want to do that because that will reduce the amount of heat that we have in that weld pool, can lead to some issues with lack of fusion, in my opinion. But um, I do use a slight like forward and back motion with my manipulation as I, as I make weld, especially like horizontal fillets. I like doing a forward and back. It just gives me a good rhythm. I feel like it gives me a really good profile to the, to the bead, helps me control the heat a little bit, um, agitates the weld pool. And uh, I feel like it makes me more consistent because I'm constantly, um, I can kind of fix the weld as I'm going, depending on what I, I'm seeing. You know, if I see my weld looks a little bit thinner, I can come back into the weld pool a little bit more. 
If, if not, I can kind of speed up, whatever. But you get the idea. A lot of people do um, like a W pattern up and down as they're welding. A lot of people do like a cursive E. People do C's. I mean, all, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. There is a lot of like really pronounced whipping, especially in like the automotive world of welding. Um, a lot of people will, will reduce their settings uh, quite a bit to make it a little bit colder and really do these pronounced whips to kind of give it that dime look, which is very, very, that, the appearance of that weld is very, very pleasing. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of arguments about whether or not that gives you the best uh, structural, um, you know, application there in terms of safety and strength and stuff like that. But we won't get into that. I'm just telling you kind of what the difference is there. Um, and, uh, you know, how that will um, affect the appearance of your weld. Okay, so that's a bit of, that's about it for uh, technique on, um, on GMAW in terms of basic technique. We'll get into some other stuff later, like if you look at my uh, demonstration video, we talk about going vertical up, how those angles are, are changed in that way, and uh, there's a little bit more um, in-depth uh, explanation of like the components of the, um, of the main gun and stuff like that. So check that out in the other video. All right. So now let's talk about the gases and how those affect, uh, the modes of transfer for GMAW welding. So we have two different, uh, types of gases that we use with welding in general. Uh, we have inert gases and then we have, uh, reactive gases. And the difference between that is an inert gas uh, will not affect the chemical composition of your weld pool or the base metal. They will not add anything chemically to the weld. So um, that is something that is attractive in some ways and uh, sometimes is not really an issue. It depends. Um, so, you know, argon and helium are both staples of the welding industry. Um, argon gas is readily available, um, is not all too expensive, so that has become the staple for um, inert gases in welding. And uh, it has a pretty good penetration profile as well in terms of um, it transfers, uh, it, it has a pretty good penetration in the center of the bead, um, but it doesn't transfer heat very well to the outside areas of the arc. So the penetration profile um, is a little bit more um, unbalanced. It's kind of deep in the center, but doesn't go out very wide. So that's why we have other gases, such as reactive gases, that we can add to um, inert gases to balance them out, which is very much the case um, in GMAW. So the uh, most common uh, gas that we're gonna use in uh, mixtures for GMAW would be argon, just because helium um, typically isn't needed uh, in, in the GMAW process as much, and it's more expensive. So uh, we, we typically stick with, with argon. Um, in terms of the reactive gases uh, for uh, GMAW, we basically have two different types of gases that we see used quite a bit, carbon dioxide and oxygen, okay? So these are reactive. They actually will add things chemically to the base material in the weld, and that's why they call it a reactive gas. And you can see right by the, the chemical elements that make them up. There's uh, carbon in, in, uh, in CO2, carbon and oxygen, right? So that can add some carbon to our base material. So for, um, for carbon steel, it's a great choice, right? Because we don't care if it has a little bit more carbon and some, some, uh, some oxygen as well. Um, but for stainless steel, that might be an issue, right? Because we don't really want to add carbon to uh, stainless steel or even aluminum, right? Um, so... Uh, typically what we see is an argon CO2 mix and typically we see that mixed about 75 25 argon CO2 that's probably the most common mixture that we see in the welding industry it has a very good um, uh, just way that the the arc um, is very very stable it's very soft arc it produces really nice uh, appearance wise uh, welds and um, very easy, very user friendly, right? So we see a lot of 7525 um, for short circuit um, MIG welding, okay? 
Now, the reason why I said short circuit MIG welding is that uh, we need a certain amount of argon to go from short circuit welding to what we call spray welding. So there's at some point you need about 80% or more um, argon to actually go into true spray mode, okay? So let me explain to you what the difference is here and what I'm actually talking about when I talk about the different modes of transfer. So I've listed the different modes of transfer here and the first one that we've been talking about is short circuit. Now this is at low amperages and voltages. So this is typically where we start out. We're gonna be starting out on thinner materials when we first start out welding typically. So our mode of transfer would be short circuit. And we know that we're in short circuit if the sound of the, the weld is like um, bacon sizzling, right? We're hearing that short circuiting. So what's actually happening is, is that when we pull that trigger and that, uh, that wire starts to advance, it makes contact with the base material, which is a short circuit, right? The, the voltage starts to build up in that uh, wire until we get what's called the pinch effect, which means that it will actually pinch off a droplet of molten weld metal, and then that will be transferred into the base material or the weld pool, and then the, the wire advances again and uh, makes contact again, and that whole pinch effect just keeps on happening. This can happen, you know, hundreds of times per second, and that's that sizzling that we're hearing, um, that's a sizzling sound that we're hearing uh, when we're welding. That is short circuit. So it's actually making contact with the base material, building up voltage, snapping off through the pinch effect, and then that's starting over. It just keeps on going. But that's at low voltages and amperage. Not enough voltage there to actually start transferring the, the weld metal across the arc, uh, the arc zone without making contact. That's short circuit. Now, as we start to raise our parameters up, voltage and wire feed speeds start to go up. Sooner or later, we're going to transfer, we're going to, um, transition into what's called globular okay now that's where the the um, the filler metal isn't actually making contact with the base material every time it's kind of uh, it because the parameters are so high when it gets close it will form these big globular type droplets which will then be transferred and they're kind of transferred irregularly so you get kind of a lot of, of weld metal flying all over the place in the form of spatter and uh, kind of a messy look to the weld. Uh, but, you know, if you keep on turning up your, your parameters and you don't have enough argon to actually uh, transfer into what's called spray mode, which we're going to talk about next, you'll stay in that globular mode and you will get a lot of spatter, um, even though it's a, it's, um, you know, it is a nice hot weld. So that's globular mode. So that's where our, um, our wire starts to come down. And we're going to see these big sort of globs being transferred to the base material rather than um, making contact like we do with short circuit. Short circuit is actually going to make contact with the base material. Okay? Now, as long as we have enough argon, like I said, at least 80%, but a lot of times to get to true spray mode where it's just like a quiet you know, transfer of the weld onto the base material, will have to be even higher than that. But if we have enough argon, then we can transfer into what's called, we can transition into what's called spray mode, which in that case, our arc is kind of this, um, this triangle look to it where the weld metal, uh, the filler metal is coming down and it's got enough voltage where, and, and the right type of gas to where it's being axially transferred across the weld area to the base material. It's like a little flamethrower of weld metal. It's just spraying it right on there, giving us a nice smooth bead. That is spray mode. That's actual spray mode, okay? But again, we need argon gas. We have to have argon, and we have to have a lot of it in order because it facilitates that spray transfer, okay? Now, there's one more that are only, um, only when the, the power source is capable of this. It's called pulse spray which means that our parameters are, are high enough to where we are actually in spray mode, but the power source will actually regulate the amount of current. It will have a high peak current and a low background current, and it's going to fluctuate. It's going to instantly snap between those two um, amperages um, 
to achieve a pulse. And what that does is that gives us really good deposition, lets us put down a nice hot weld um, and a lot of, of weld um, in a short period of time, but it kind of re it, it reduces that background amperage enough to where we can weld out of position. Um, spray mode is very, very hot, lots of deposition, so it's typically only in the flat and horizontal positions, although I've seen it done uh, plenty of times overhead, like overhead fillet welds and stuff like that in spray mode. Believe it or not, you can do it. Um, but vertical up, not so much. You're going to get a real droopy weld, and it, you know most likely the weld pool is going to fall out at some point. So pulse spray gives us the option of uh, being able to use that out of position, which is very, very uh, attractive. And also on some other types of material, it's very attractive too. Like if, you know, for stainless steel or for aluminum, um, where, you know, um, uh, heat control really comes into play. Um, so these are our four modes of transfer. And again, you know, you just need to know that um, if you're going to achieve spray, you need argon gas and really know the difference between spray mode, um, globular and short circuit, uh, just to be well versed in GMAW. All right, so that's the different uh, uh, types of gases and the different modes of transfer. Um, we could get, we could talk all day just about gases and gas mixtures and stuff, um, but we won't get into that too much, trying to keep it simple for this sort of introductory uh, um, lecture to GMAW. The one thing that I will uh, mention is that uh, we typically will choose our gas mixtures based on the processes that we use a lot. So for instance, I talked about that 7525 gas earlier. Uh, that is a very uh, common gas in uh, production type situations. Again, produces a very uh, nice appearance wise. Um, weld is very user friendly. So we use that um, for those types of situations. But, so that would be a 7525 argon CO2, okay? But if, um, you know, cost all, also comes into play here. So we have, if we have a, uh, you know, a production type situation where we just want to put down as much uh, weld as quickly as possible, um, and we aren't really worried about the appearance as much, we might go to 100% CO2. And what that does is that gives us a good quality weld in terms of strength, but it produces a lot of spatter, has sort of a mottled appearance on the surface, which makes it a little bit less attractive visually, but it is very inexpensive. CO2 is, is very inexpensive compared to argon. So in that case, if, if um, cost is always an issue, right? It doesn't really matter um, who you are. You're always going to be concerned with, you know, how much is it going to cost me to make this, you know? Um, so if cost isn't an issue, I mean, if cost is an issue, appearance isn't so much of an issue and production um, is, is something that you want, then 100% CO2 may be a better choice for you. And then from there, we also have some mixtures which are like a 98.2, or a 95.5, uh, 98.2 would be argon O2, okay, argon and oxygen, which is very common for spray welding. Now we have 98% argon, which is going to facilitate that spray welding really well, and then the oxygen just adds some, a little bit more, um, you know, heat in the weld pool and some other things to achieve uh, a, more of a balanced arc, okay? But that 98% argon would be if we're gonna do mostly spray welding. Okay, so you will see these three are probably the, the three most common for carbon steel uh, MIG welding, and you will make a decision based on, on um, what you're going to do uh, more often, okay? All right, so now let's talk about electrode classification. And uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that the specification that this classification falls under. Specification is like a group of electrodes that are all put together. Um, AWS, American Welding Society, puts out a specification for um, you know, what should be included with all these electrodes um, so that there's kind of a rule book that they all fall under. But they, they group them together based on uh, process and usability and stuff like that. So this would fall under the A5.18 which is, is the specification for carbon steel filler metals 
for gas shielded arc welding processes. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is, um, one, it's only for carbon steel. So you'd have a different specification, which would have different classifications and a whole different system for classification for like stainless steel and aluminum. Um, and also that it just says it's basically carbon steel filler metals for gas shielded arc welding processes, which means that this particular specification and classification is also the same for carbon steel filler metals for TIG welding. So an ER70S-6 classification uh, that comes in a roll or a spool for MIG welding is exactly the same chemical composition as an ER70S-6 that comes in a pre-length cut for manual welding to um, for TIG, okay? So it's the same specification, can be used the same way. You can cut it right off the spool and you can use that for filler metal for TIG and it's going to have the same chemical composition and strength uh, requirements and all that kind of stuff, okay? So just kind of something to think about and uh, you know just makes you a little bit more knowledgeable. So that's the A5.18. Now the whole uh, number letter combination that makes up the, uh, the classification here, all the digits mean something just like we talked about in SMAW. So because this can be used for um, manual uh, filler rod or an electrode in the case of GMAW, th these first two digits stand for electrode or rod, okay? So electrode means that it carries the current and a rod means that it's just filler metal to add to the weld pool, okay? But it, they're basically the same thing. It can be either or, okay? The next two digits are for the tensile strength. Tensile strength in KSI, which means 70 times 1,000. So in this case, it would be 70,000 PSI is the tensile strength of this particular filler metal. Um, and again, the tensile strength test is where they take a sample of this weld metal, and, or filler metal in this case, and they pull it apart until it fails. And then they record that the amount of pressure that it took to, uh, to actually get a failure. And that would be the tensile strength. Okay, so this has a minimum tensile strength that's, that's required of the, of the filler metal, which makes sense, right? The next digit here is an S, and this would uh, stand for a solid electrode, meaning that it's not tubular, there's nothing inside of it, it's solid, okay? Uh, so you will only see, if you see an S there, you know that it's a MIG welding wire because those are solid wires, okay? Now this last digit is uh, what we call the chemical composition, That's called the chemical composition. So that is uh, kind of additional things that are added to the filler metal um, to give it different properties. In this case, the six is very, very common. This is silica. So they add um, extra silica to the weld metal. And that's actually what you see um, kind of uh, come up to the surface on a nice hot bead. You see that sort of brown glassy type stuff on the surface. I get asked a lot if, you know, is that okay? I don't know why I'm getting this on my weld. That is the silica um, coming up to the surface. And what that does is that gives you a real good fluidity of the puddle, uh, makes it very user friendly in terms of, um, you know, giving you a nice fluid puddle and giving you a good look to, uh, to your welds as you're welding. So that's why that's so common. But there's a whole bunch of different chemical compositions that are available that have different effects, um, also have effects on cost too. Um, so, you know, it is something to, to um, look at and think about. And with some different alloys, you, might, um, you may have some different things that are recommended um, for welding, okay? So that's the basic uh, chemical, uh, chemical composition. That's the basic electrode classification. I can't talk. That's the basic electrode classification for GMAW. Um, and then there are some variations there, like if you get into low alloy electrodes, there's a 5.28, uh, which is a low alloy, which just means that a little bit different um, chemical compositions, different uses, higher tensile strengths, uh, like weathering steels for um, being more um, you know, exposed to the elements and stuff like that. But um, they'll fall under a similar um, classification as this but we'll get into that um, at a later time. 
So uh, hopefully, I hope this uh, video has been helpful for you um, and uh, in just kind of uh, shedding some light on the, the different elements there for uh, GMAW welding. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.